Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you all here. It's great to um, fellowship. Thank you so much for coming. We are um, grateful to have Tim and his family here and looking forward to our time with them today. I don't have any announcements that anybody asked me to share. So what's happening with Children's Church today? Where's Rachel? I think um, up through third. I don't think we're doing third through fifth. Okay, so up through second grade, we'll have Children's Church. Um, if you're a guest, if you're new, welcome. We're great, grateful that you came. Um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get our day started. Lord, Abba Father, we are, we come today, Lord, expectantly, grateful for your presence, grateful for each brother and sister who are here to join us as we worship you, as we learn about you, as we are fed. Thank you for Tim, and just bless him as he brings your word, and help us to have hearts to receive. And Lord, as we enter into worship, I just pray that all of the thoughts and the things that would distract us would strangely fade away as we enjoy our time with you. We love you so much, but help us to love you more. Help our love and our knowledge of you to be ever increasing. Bring us each into your will. Carry us through on the paths we should walk. Lord, we pray for RJ, who's going through a big healing with his uh, collarbone. I believe he has surgery tomorrow. We just pray for um, a perfect surgery, Lord, that would repair that collarbone and um, restore him. And Lord, anybody in our group who is dealing with illness, Lord, we lift them up to you, knowing, knowing that you are the one who created and designed each cell in our body and every system is subject to your lordship and so we just trust them into your hands thank you lord we love you amen all right well let's stand and worship
true worship comes to come from. And it's not necessarily a song that we all have us to sing together, but something that comes out of our heart, deep in the pit of our spirit. And I just say, let's just take some time here, and whatever the Lord is putting on you to sing out, just sing your own song. Praise you, God. Oh, Ooh. how we praise you. Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Thank you guys for your patience as I learn names. We have been flipping through the three-ring binder, quizzing ourselves, and we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, so thankful uh, to be... Am I supposed to release children or anything? Or are they already released? They're good? Okay, okay, sweet, okay. Um, well, it's good to see everybody here. Um, man, I just, during the worship, I just had this great, just something, just, it's really strong in my heart, um, that the Lord has the power to melt the hardest heart, just, which is a good thing, since you know, I think I happen to have one of those, but, um, so good to be with you guys. Unfortunately, Emily and Mercy couldn't be here, they were sick this morning, so I think they're probably watching online, Lord heal them in Jesus' name. But we're, uh, we're excited to be here with you guys again. Um, man, what an interesting season I think we all find ourselves in. 
you know, we're seeking the Lord's will together, and, you know, we've, uh, um, we've, I think Chuck shared with you, I'm pretty sure, you know, we've communicated, as we've prayed, we feel like it would be an honor and a joy to be able to be a part of the spiritual family. Um, But having said that, we don't assume, we don't presume anything. You know, honestly, um, the last thing you would want is for, for somebody like me to be here if this wasn't what the Lord wanted. And the last thing we would want, right? I mean, I, it's better to be a taxi driver in the middle of nowhere with the Lord if that's where he wants you. Um, and I, you know, I trust you guys have been scoping out our website and all that stuff. I mean, it's so important to do due diligence on those things. <laughs> Right? And, and, you know, it's funny, I, I think back, you know, you, when you, that's the world we live in, this online world, um, you know, when you have 15 years of sermons that have, are floating out there somewhere, right? You're always wondering, hmm, I wonder which one somebody comes across at that time. <laughs> you know, like, you know I, I'll go back and listen to something you know you did, and you're like, it just, it's painful. Like, oh, oh, man, did I, did I say, oh, you know, and, but then somebody will email you and be like, this message changed my life. And you're like, okay, and. You know, when you when you preach and teach long enough, you realize it's it's it's, it's, you, it's important to realize at some point that it's not about you. You know, there have been times where I've I've preached a message and you come away and you're thinking to yourself, kind of, you know, I, I don't want to be prideful, but that could arguably be the best message that's ever been preached on planet Earth. And so then suddenly you get a, a little feedback. You're like, that was probably, that, that had no impact whatsoever. And then you find out, like, you, you come away and you'll preach a message. And you're like, that was probably the worst message I've ever preached. And somebody will come to you. And you're like, that message changed my life. I, I will never forget it. I, and you're like, it just, the Lord, his way of showing you, it's about him, right? It's, <laughs> it's, about, it's about his faithfulness. And so um, we're thankful to be here. Um, so, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll start. Does that sound good? I think we have scriptures locked and loaded for the screen. And All right. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, we, uh, we are your servants. Lord, we don't belong to ourselves. We are here to serve you and to bring glory and honor to your name. God, we do pray that you would do the very thing that we're speaking about today, Lord, and, and bring a, about new creation in our hearts through the Spirit and through the Word of God. Give us tender hearts and melt our hearts, Lord, so that they're moldable in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. So a couple weeks ago when Emily and I came up on that Wednesday night, Phil asked a great question. Just so, what about Sunday mornings? You know, what do you see Sunday mornings being about? And um, I answered with the question, my answer uh, was kind of spontaneous, but it was like Genesis 1. And... Uh, the real question is, what is what does God want Sunday mornings to be about, right? And we, we our goal is to serve that. If we're if we're kind of coming up with our own thing and it doesn't match what He wants, um, that doesn't bear much fruit and it, it doesn't do much good. So um, I want to start. Well, how about a little show and tell? <laughs> I brought a, a couple paintings. Um, one thing that I've done in, in a number of churches. Uh, Specifically, one in particular, but uh, somewhat in conferences and things, is we do uh, these encounter services, and they're just extended times of worship, a couple hours, where you're ministering together, worshiping the Lord together, practicing the gifts, and sometimes we'll, we'll set up art. We'll have an area for dance and communion in case people need to get right with each other, connect with the Lord, and so uh, they've often been very powerful times. So who knows if, if the Lord has us. Join arms in this race together. We, we might do some of those if you're interested. But um, so what's really cool is um, as, a, as some of those uh, paintings we uh, came forth from some of those, and I thought I'd just show you a couple of them. So this is one that was really cool. And this was kind of, um, I won't say who did it, but it's really good. I like, like it a lot. And um, anyway, I just wanted to get some thoughts. Like as you guys see this, what are some of the thoughts that come to your mind? How, um, it, it, it kind of, if you picture yourself in that worship service, and and this this painting is starting to take shape, um, 
What are some thoughts in terms of the message that comes to your mind? Surrender? Any other thoughts? Help from God? That's right. Inspiration? Desperation. Desperation? Yeah. Um, the theme on her heart uh, at that particular service was from Second Corinthians 12, that um, in, in, his, in our weakness he is strong, and that his grace is sufficient, right? And what a great picture of that, right? And so I want to so imagine yourself during the worship, we're seeking the Lord, we're calling on His name, and there's uh, somebody in the corner painting, and you're you're praying, and you glance over at it, and you look at it, right? What impact do you imagine something like this might have on somebody in that kind of context? I mean, if you're in a place of weakness and crying out in desperation, right? This might impact your heart, right? And you might say, wow, that's me right now. I don't have words for it, but that's me. Any other thoughts? How might this impact somebody if they're watching this being painted? You think hope? Yes. Maybe an impartation of strength in their inner being. So the Lord can use something like this to do a work in his people, right? That's that's the point. Obviously, there's multiple ways that can happen. You know, I'll, I'll pull out another one here. In this particular service, um, my friend who formerly used his gifts to uh, to make railway, railroads and railway stations look more interesting and, and uh, with graffiti, right? But he came to know the Lord, and now he used his art in, to serve the Lord. But um, in this particular service, it was really amazing because... He, he had this impression about the Lord wanting just to pour out his spirit on children. And what was amazing was it was like the Lord was just this maestro within the various participants in the service. That theme kept coming up. We had, inter- we had a time of intercession. And before we realized it, the whole service kind of went, went in this direction. And the Lord was giving his, of his heart for this generation. I mean, there was a real burden, just the things that the youth are facing and that we need the the Lord's river of life to flow, right? So similar kind of thing. And the Lord was just orchestrating that and doing a work in the midst of his people. Well, so this is kind of what we're going to, we're going to talk about. Keep those in, in mind as examples, but this is just one practical way. You try to create a context for God to do, fulfill his purposes for his people and in his people and through his people, right? That's really what we're doing at church. We're giving God room to do his work, to do what only he can do. Have, how many of you have ever played the, the why game or the how game as kids you know, or pestered your parents with that game, right? Or your spouse, have you, <laughs> you know, the why game. Why, why, why? And, um, you know, there's something actually helpful about that game. You know, think about baseball. Well, well Dad, why? Why do they? Why do the pitchers throw the ball across the plate? Because they want to get a strike. Well, why do they want to get a strike? Well, they want to get the guy out. Well, why do they want to get the guy out? Because they need to get three outs to win the inning. Have uh, the inning. Well, why do they want to do that? And why? why and finally, it's, well, because they want to win the game. Well, why do they want to get win the game? Because we like to win. Well, why do we like to win? Because we're competitive creatures who like to trample on others. I don't know. I mean, you kind of, kind of, the, the, the why, the why uh, keeps going deeper. And what it does is it, 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 draw, it brings you into the question of purpose, right? Well, what is the purpose? Why are we doing what we're doing? And how does that come about? Different layers of purpose. Well, this can actually help us get a, a, a clearer vision of church. Why do we gather? And what, what is our purpose actually as human beings? And is that purpose being fulfilled when we gather together in the name of Jesus? So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to kind of structure our discussion tonight, uh, this, this morning around different layers of purpose. Because once we really understand that, then everything else becomes we build to facilitate that purpose. And it's just important that the purpose is actually God's purpose, right? Right. If, you, if, we, if, we're, if we're building in ways that aren't 
around that purpose, we end up building things that won't last. It can be it can be entertaining, it can be interesting, things like that, but it won't bear lasting fruit if it's not facilitating his clearly stated purpose. So, um, so let's go ahead and, and talk about this. What is God's vision for his people? What is our ultimate purpose as human beings? And the answers to this, these questions, these types of questions, they give us a vision not only for Sunday mornings, but any type of church expression, any time we gather in his name, what we're to be about and what God is trying to accomplish. So the first one I want to talk about is the ultimate purpose. The, our ultimate purpose is to glorify the Creator. To glorify the Creator. That's why we exist, to give Him praise, to bring Him honor. And when we start bringing ourselves honor and ourselves praise and, and self-exaltation, things start to break. It doesn't take long for that to show itself as folly and, and, and a lack of wisdom. So our main purpose is to glorify the Creator and to glorify His name. Any any thoughts about in the Bible when you're reading about God's name? Or like Abraham, he's changed from Abram to Abraham. Or we worship your name, O God. What does the name mean in Scripture? Any thoughts? I'm making you work a little bit. The name. What if I say... Joe, uh, Joe in our community, he's got a good name. What am I saying there? Reputation. And a reputation for something, right? He's either got a good name or a bad name. <laughs> and if you have a good name, it means somebody's probably going to trust you, maybe do business with you, right? If you've got a bad name, maybe you've done some things that show yourself not trustworthy. And the word gets out. So you can see that relationship between character and reputation, right? What somebody is how somebody is perceived, and how that affects relationships. Well, the same is true of God, right? His name. Who is He? And when you talk about the name of God in Scripture, it's talking about everything that makes Him who He is. Everything about Him that makes Him good. And that's what He wants His reputation to be in the world. That's what He wants others to conclude about Him, is something that actually is in accordance with who He is, right? This is about his reputation in the world. And that's a weighty calling as followers of Jesus who bear that name. To think about others drawing conclusions about who he is based on their observation of us, it, it should cause us to tremble, right? It's a weighty calling, a weighty responsibility. So Romans 11.36, For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Just one example of multitudes of verses in Scripture that talk about our main purpose as creatures and as followers of Jesus to be for His glory and the glory of His name. Everything comes from Him, it's through Him, and it's for Him, something we offer to Him so that He will be glorified. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This is a very insightful verse because it shows us the Lord is worthy. He is worthy of glory and honor and power and praise. And then it gives us the reason why. For, for you created all things. There's only one creator. There's only one who has the power to bring something out of nothing. And because he created all things, he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise. It was by His will that they were created and have their being. Psalm 99, 1-3 says, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awe-inspiring name. He is holy. So holiness in the Bible, God is distinct. His name is everything that is good at the highest degree. He is set apart. And He is awe-inspiring. Everything about who He is should strike us with wonder and strike us with awe and cause us to love Him and tremble before Him and say, You are worthy. You are the Creator. You're the only one who can create something out of this mess, of this circumstance, this, this mess called my heart right now. 
You are the creator and I give you praise. You're holy. Well, let's look at that name. Exodus 33, 19, A, 34, 5 through 7. Uh, I didn't give the whole verse, but we have enough here to, to get the context. It says, And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. So notice this link here between God's goodness and his name. Now he's going to give us further definition about what that means. It says, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, that about himself, his character, his reputation, which is good, the Lord. He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents of the third and fourth generation. So think about this. He is holy. He is great. He is awe-inspiring because of his goodness in his name. He is unique and set apart. Set apart in compassion. Think about Jesus. Why are we drawn to him? He is God made flesh. Look how compassionate he is. There's no one like him. We see the compassion of God lived out through his life and ministry. Think about his slowness to anger. Oh, praise God for that one. Lord, you refrain from... You, you warn me, you correct me, but you're slow to anger. You're patient with me. You're compassionate. You're abounding in love and faithful. I can call on your name and trust you to do what you said you would do in my life and in my church. And you forgive wickedness. You forgive sin. But also, praise God, he does not turn a blind eye to sin either, does he? Think about it. What if you had a king or a ruler who didn't actually deal with murder or stealing or any other kinds of sin, right? It would be chaos. It would be chaos. The goodness of God is seen both in his mercy towards sinners and in his unwavering commitment to righteousness and truth. And so we give thanks to him, for he is good and his love endures forever. He is compassionate, merciful, and kind, and his love endures forever. And so we exist to glorify his name. As a church, when we gather together, is this happening? Are we exalting Him for His mercy? Do people understand, hey, when I, when I encounter this people, the mercy of God is shown to me, and the reputation of God as merciful is promoted in our community. Or these other things, He's slow to anger. Oh, but also, man, those Christians, they can be stubborn, like... Yeah, they're very merciful, but there's no changing the standard of, of what God says about right and wrong with them, right? That you need both. As I, always, I sometimes say, as Christians, we're called to be the most compassionate, merciful people on the earth and the most stubborn at the same time. And, and then when we, when we, are, when we do that, uh, we're asking him for his, all aspects of his goodness to be revealed in our midst. So we exist for the glory of God. This is our ultimate purpose. Everything else we do, children's ministry, adult ministry, preaching, teaching, worship, potlucks, or pot blessings, <laughs> sorry, all of these things, right? These are, for, these are ultimately for, for His glory. So now we're going to remember the why game or, or the how game. Okay, so for the glory of God, this is our ultimate purpose. Well, how does glory come to His name? How is this purpose or goal realized in and through his people? And two key parts of the answer that you read about consistently in the scriptures is through acceptable worship, worship that is true and pleasing in his sight, that's in accordance with truth, and through fruitfulness, through fruitfulness, the kind of fruitfulness that only he can bring about as the creator. So... We, guys, we, we know this verse from John chapter 4. What did Jesus, Jesus tell the woman at the, the well? A time is coming and is now coming is now here when the true, first, true worshipers will worship the Father, what? 
in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father is what? That's right. These are the ones he seeks. These are the ones he's looking for. Those who worship him in spirit and truth. In spirit could be translated in the spirit, or it could be in spirit in the sense of sincerely from the heart. Either one works because the spirit gives us the sincerity of heart, right? Uh, I think of the psalm, Psalm 24. Give us, uh, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who comes before the Lord without anything to hide, not trying to put on a show, but comes before the Creator, asking Him to do His work. Another passage uh, about this, Romans 15, 5-9. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Therefore, welcome one another, just as Christ also welcomed you to the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises to the fathers, and so that Gentiles may glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing praise to your name. So pay close attention to these purpose words, so that, in order that, that we come together, there's endurance and encouragement as we live among one another according to Christ. We strive to be in unity together, to work out our conflicts, to resolve differences, to love one another, to forgive one another, so that we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. And it's, when you go into a church, it's, it, it becomes quick, quickly evident when there's dissension. You can feel it, I think, in a congregation. You can feel it in the worship. You can feel it in the Spirit. And because I think some of those things, they grieve the Holy Spirit, right? Well, we want to come and we want to live in unity with one another around the cross so that we can worship Him with one heart and one voice and sing praise to His name so that He is glorified. 2 Timothy 2.22 Flee from youthful passions, pursue righteousness, righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. It's not just the amount of worship, but the quality of it that matters to the Lord. That we're coming before Him. Lord, change my heart. Lord, be exalted. We're not coming with pretense. There's not a discrepancy between the outward and the inward. Which he obviously sees through anyway, right? So God is glorified. We exist, to, we exist to glorify God. That's our main purpose. How does that happen? Well, we glorify him through true and acceptable worship and through fruitfulness. So fru- as for fruitfulness, this is another verse you guys probably know. He says in John 15, This is to my Father's glory that you what? Bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples, right? This brings the Father glory. When we bear fruit that reflects our master, our disciple maker, Jesus. When we begin to look like Jesus more and more, more and more fruit comes from our lives. God is glorified more and more. And I love this passage from Philippians 1. It says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. With knowledge and all discernment. Would you say Jesus himself abounds with love more and more in knowledge and all discernment? Of course. And then here's the purpose, verse 10. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. There's coming a day when we're going to meet our Savior in the clouds. He's going to restore all things and raise us from the dead. And he's doing a work of creation in us in preparation for the day that we see Him. And I want to stand before Him on that day and say, Lord, it wasn't, I didn't waste my time. I really was giving myself to the things and the purposes for which You created me. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And this is a key point. The fruit comes through Him, through His Spirit within us. By His operation within us. By His gift within us. It's not just, we just read a textbook and suddenly we're bearing fruit. It's not that we just 
read a social media post and we're bearing fruit. It's not that we just have opinions about this or that theological topic and we're bearing fruit. No, it's the gift of God in the inner man working in us and strengthening us and creating us that produces that fruit. And this is why it's through Jesus Christ. And when that kind of fruit comes forth, it's to the glory and praise of God, which is the fulfillment of our ultimate purpose. So you see the different layers here. We're coming to church because we want to see fruitfulness and we want to give Him acceptable worship. And we want to do that so that we give Him praise and glory, which He deserves. So these different layers of purpose. Do you kind of see how we're developing this here? Okay. So we need Jesus to bear the kind of fruit that brings God glory. Well, how does that happen? Why, right? The next, the next uh, layer. How are true worship and fruitfulness produced? And this happens through the Creator's work of creating. Only the Creator can create. I mean, we can kind of, we have a, we can create some things, but it's all really imitating who He is as the ultimate Creator. Without Him, without His creation, we wouldn't be able to create anything. Creation is a work that only God can accomplish. So we know this verse as well, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. And you think about a baby in the womb. The baby's conceived. The baby grows and develops in the womb, and eventually there's a birth, right? Well, this is kind of how we think of new creation in the New Testament, where we receive the Holy Spirit as a deposit, but we still have our bodies of death, right? We're still not, Anybody here resurrected yet? Have a resurrected body yet? If you do, talk to me later and show me where you got it, right? But we, we receive the Spirit as a deposit, and there's a conception. And then between now and the second coming, there's growth in the womb. And then when you, when you read Romans chapter 8, it says that, that all creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed through birth, basically, for the earth to give birth to its dead. So the birth takes place. Those, the sons and daughters of God are revealed from out of the womb, if you will, at the resurrection when Jesus returns. And we're born and we get our resurrected bodies. So this is the process that's happening when, we, when we're made new creations. We're conceived, and then we share in Jesus' Jesus' own resurrected glory when he returns and raises us from the dead. Awesome! It's amazing, the gift of God that he's given us. Uh, Isaiah 43, it's talking here about Israel and what God will do with Israel uh, in the end. But it, it uses this language of God creating people for his glory. He says, I will say to the north, give them up to the south. Do not hold them back. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Okay, pay attention to the language here. Everyone who bears my name, created for my glory, I have formed them and I have made them. So here we have it. The goal is his glory. We must be remade and recreated by Him for that to take place. We need the Creator to produce acceptable worship and fruitfulness in us through His power. Second uh, Thessalonians 1, Paul says, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. So when we, when we see the, uh, the apostles praying for people, and they're the ones entrusted with building the foundation of the church, we need to pay attention to what they're praying. They're praying for it. reveals their real concerns. We pray that our God may make you worthy of His calling and that by His power He may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. And why do we pray this? We pray this so that what? I'll let you guys read that. Very good. So we see the purpose. We pray that God would bring your every desire for goodness and the deeds prompted by your faith to fruition. He'd bring them about so that the name of Jesus will be glorified according to the grace of God, according to the gift that he's given you. So what does this look like practically in everyday life? It looks like, Lord, I know who you are. I know that you're slow to anger. You look down at your kid. They're drawing on the wall. I don't feel slow to anger right now. Like, that's a lot of money. 
That's overtime right there. Oh, Lord, you're slow to anger. And so you're praying, oh, God, I long, I have a desire to be slow to anger with my child right now. Please come. And the Creator, it may seem small, but that little prayer, the Creator says, if it's in truth and sincerity, the Creator will often, I've seen it many times, he'll come in and give you that in your spirit. And you're like, okay, let's come over here and come over here and draw on the paper, <laughs> right? And suddenly it's, it's, there's, there's an element of patience and slowness to anger that comes forth that's created in you in that moment. And it feels so mundane. Nobody else sees it but Him. But it brings Him glory. And you're fulfilling your purpose as a creature in that moment. So you see how this logic works here. Whether we're talking about our, our lives at home, at work, or whatever, or as a corporate body, the same logic applies so, um, so acceptable worship, fruitfulness result from God's unique work of creating. He who began a good work in you will carry it on until when? Until the day of Christ Jesus when he completes it, right? He who started a work of creation in you will continue to create until he comes back and raises you from the dead and puts you on display as this marvelous resurrected creature in glory. And you're like, wow, that was all happening behind the scenes? In preparation for that, this work of creation, it's powerful. It's powerful. So, the next layer. We exist for the glory of God. Purpose one, that's our highest purpose. That happens through acceptable worship and through fruitfulness, right? Acceptable worship and fruitfulness. And acceptable worship and fruitfulness happen through new creation, through the Spirit of God working. Well, how does new creation happen? It happens through His Word and His Spirit. I want you to look, let's look at this. You guys have read this, I'm sure, a number of times, Genesis 1. There's a pattern here in the opening chapter of Genesis that continues throughout the rest of Scripture. And this pattern is that when God creates, He does it through His Word and Spirit. His Spirit moves, His Word speaks, and creation happens. Okay? Genesis 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was what? There was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. The darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. So when you read Genesis 1, you see God creating. And he's separating, right? He, se he says... Water here, land here. He says, sun and moon and stars there. Animals here. Like he's, he's arranging things. He's filling things. He's setting things in their proper order. So he brings things into existence. And then he rightly orders them so that they bring him glory. And uh, this in, in Psalm 33, 6, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. His breath is his spirit. It's the same word. God, through His Spirit and His Word, is bringing things into existence and setting things into proper arrangement. This pattern is so vital. It gives us such practical insight about how we organize ourselves as a church. Are we setting ourselves up and positioning ourselves for God's Word and Spirit to move in our midst to do works of new creation? So this is where it gets, you start getting down to kind of the practical side. You start seeing, oh, wait a minute, if this is how it happens, then we need to position ourselves through His Word and Spirit in certain ways so that He can create us anew as a body. So let me give an example. Like, for example, in the, in the flood and in the Exodus, you have similar language. The Exodus, you have the water, and God separates the water, right? He moves the water, and they walk through on dry land. Or the flood, right? The flood is kind of an act of, uh, it's a reverse of creation in a sense, right? Where remember in the beginning, you have the spirit brooding over the waters and God speaks and then divides the waters and brings land out of the waters so that life can exist on the land. But then in the flood, he kind of covers the earth over with water again and he starts anew after, after the flood. Well, this same pattern applies throughout scriptures, the scriptures, and it even applies in, in the lives of individuals like King David. 
For example, uh, David had a little problem called the Bathsheba thing, right? <laughs> that was a that was a big problem, right? <laughs> I mean, murder, adultery, big problems, and uh, the Lord called them out on it. So that's the context of Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is David's prayer of repentance when God confronts him on those sins. And this is a great example of how this isn't just abstract theology. God's word, spirit, create. Like this is how it gets, this is what it looks like in our actual lives. So David realizes, oh my goodness, what have I done? I have not brought honor to his name. Did that bring honor, did those things bring honor to, to God's name? They did not, right? And so he, God wasn't glorified through that. And David recognizes that. Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Notice that God, David goes straight to God's name. This is who you are. My only hope is in your mercy. This is who you've revealed yourself to be, as holy and unique in compassion. My only hope is your compassion right now, God. And I think the Lord loves that when we just cast ourselves fully on who he's revealed himself to be. And that's why David, I think, was a man after God's own heart, despite his massive sins at times. Verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your spirit, your Holy Spirit, from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So think about David. I mean, I just picture him. Lord, I've sinned greatly. I have such darkness in me and the darkness took hold of me. Oh God, I need your light to come and to separate me from that sin, to separate me from those evil desires. To set me in order again, I need your breath to come into me and to give me a steadfast spirit so that I don't do these things. I need the Creator to sustain me. Don't take your spirit from me because your spirit is all I have. To create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And you can see how at the very core of discipleship, if you will, is this idea of God creating us through His Word and Spirit. Does this make any sense? Okay. I'm, I'm trying to keep it from being just kind of abstract theology, but it's these are important truths on which we build our lives in the day-to-day. -day. Um, just, you know, just to uh, open up my own heart a little bit, you know, a couple weeks ago, I, uh, I was having my, my devotions in the morning, and... I did, you know, I don't know about you, but a lot of mornings I don't wake up feeling like super spiritually charged. It's like, okay, coffee. You get your coffee and you, where's my Bible? Okay, you know, you know, just kind of dragging, dragging yourself along. And I was having, you know, just sitting there and um, getting ready to start my time in the Word. But I, before I really even got into it, I just had this phrase that went through my heart. And I knew it theologically. And it just was simply, it was this, I love you, my son. Yeah, one of those, oh, you know. But in that moment, it brought such life to me. And it came out of nowhere, it felt. It was just like, I love you, son. And it, something it, within me was created. Something happened within me. And I'm like, man, I'm a lot kinder to my kids when I walk out of that confidence in what he's done for me. And... You know, I think of, this, this is just an example um, of how important it is for our, our, our daily times with the Lord and the Word. You know, um, it's, you know, we have to be disciplined, otherwise things just don't happen. But I think if we, if we, if we re, uh, rethink through what's actually happening in that moment, it can rekindle our motivation to get out of bed, to spend time with Him. What we're doing is we're positioning ourselves for a work of creation. That's what we're doing. Think about your reading. You're reading the story of, of James and John coming to Jesus. Oh, Lord, who will be the greatest in your kingdom? Can we, can we be at your right hand and your left, right? And maybe that week at work you found yourself not serving, but wanting to be the greatest. 
And, the whole, and suddenly you realize, my goodness, Lord, I'm James and John in this moment. And the Lord's like, I know. <laughs> and you're like, create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a servant spirit within me. I don't want to be a, a, somebody who lords it over the flock. I don't, want to be a, I don't want to be a pharaoh to my children. I don't want to be a dictator to my coworkers. I want to be a servant who takes out the towel and washes their feet. And it might, it's a work of new creation happens. And if you think about our lives as a painting, that particular moment, that morning when you did the 30 minutes or an hour or two hours of time with the Lord, it might, on the grand scheme of things, just be like a brushstroke, right? The Lord's creating something, but it was a brushstroke. But what happens if you don't, if you start skipping the brushstrokes? What happens to the painting in the long-term picture, right? It doesn't get made. And so that's the point is that, is that um, these, are, these are little mini moments, Genesis 1 moments taking place over a lifetime where God's painting with each stroke and we're positioning ourselves before him for that next stroke. And it might not feel, oh, I'll just skip it this, this morning, when in reality it's important. In light of the big picture. Now, of course, the Lord, if we miss our quiet time, the Lord's not like having an aneurysm at the throne room or anything. You know, he's gracious. He's gracious with us. But I think the point is, if we approach our times with him, whether in church or individually, as thinking about it in these terms, we're positioning ourselves for the Genesis 1 moment with our king, then it, it, can, it can really bring refreshing and renewal. When you think of the Great Commission, it's important to realize that he says, All authority in heaven has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey. It's important to realize that coming under Jesus' authority and being baptized into him comes first because it's only out of that place of being recreated in him that we can obey his teaching. See what I'm saying? That's an important that's an important thing. Think about baptism. It's very similar to Genesis 1. You have the Spirit of God brooding over the waters. God says, let there be land, and land emerges from the waters. And then from that land, fruit comes forth, trees and, and all kinds of things. Well, think about it. You're, you're under the water, and God brings you up out of the waters and creates you anew. That's the picture. You're made new in Christ. So God creates us through His Word and through His Spirit. So this is the pattern. God's Word and Spirit moves. New creation happens. Fruit comes forth. Acceptable, joyful, true worship comes forth. And our Creator is glorified. Our Creator is glorified. So... Uh, Whatever, Paul says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. And so this is really what church needs to be about, I think. Are we, are we positioning ourselves for those Genesis 1 moments in our midst? You know, um, that can be sometimes through a prophetic word. Um, it usually happens first and foremost through teaching and instruction in the scriptures, Right. You know, when you think about the prophetic, the prophetic needs rails to go down. If you're not strong on authoritative, biblical, apostolic teaching from the scriptures, the prophetic can get really weird sometimes, right? It's like, I think we've all probably seen time. Is, is there anybody here who's not seen the prophetic get weird? It can get, it can get way off anchor. It needs rails to go down. Because it's, if you don't have that, it's amazing how many things the Spirit can suddenly start saying that just happen to be what you want to hear all the time, right? We just don't want that. There has to be a consistent message of the cross and laying down our lives and living for the age to come and, 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 and these kinds of things. And then the Spirit will come and be like, yeah, we're tracking together. And then the Lord can entrust us with greater degrees of prophetic types of operation because we're not going to use it to exalt ourselves and bring glory to ourselves, that would be the exact opposite of the purpose of the church, right? So, for some, of, for some of us, I'll have the worship team come up, for some of us, this is maybe be a paradigm shift, right? To think about our lives as engaging with our Creator through the Holy Spirit. Forming church, structuring church to set ourselves up to encounter the living God, the Creator, 
But it's so vital. I think about what Paul says. Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill what? You won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's real, what, you're, what we're saying there is lean on the Creator in those moments. Think about it. You're walking down the street and you're, 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 you're tempted to covet. Right? Maybe you're coveting that person's business. All the things that were warned about in the Ten Commandments. Not to, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't cover your neighbor's business. You're this or that. Right? You're walking down the street. You see something that catches your eye. And you're tempted in that moment to covet. Well, you're praying in the Holy Spirit. Whether in tongues or just prayer, prayer with your mind. And you say, Jesus, strengthen my inner man. Create in me a clean heart. That does not belong to me. That does not bring you glory. And you feel your weakness in that moment. And the Creator comes and says, Strength. And you turn your, way, you turn, you turn your eyes the other way. And you're content. I'm okay with my $15 an hour. Yeah, I've got the Creator. I'm, I'm going to be renewed in the resurrection. I'm okay with that. Or, she's not my wife. My eyes are for this woman, not that one. And she's not defiled. And you walk in righteousness and integrity. See what I'm saying? This is practical, like learning to walk in the Spirit with our Creator. So I'm going to pray. If you guys, uh, we're going to ask the Lord to do that now, I guess. Let, let's, let's stand and let's cry out to Him. Let's pray for Him. Lord, come and create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. And wherever the Lord leads this church in the coming days, let it be a place where our purpose as human beings is fulfilled for His glory and for His honor and for His name. So, Lord, I pray, Father, for Grace Gospel Church. I'm so thankful for the chance to, to know these brothers and sisters in the faith. And I pray, Lord, that, that You would strengthen this fellowship and that it would be a place where Your name and Your renown and Your reputation is accurately represented. Irrespective of what the world thinks of us, Lord, and I pray for renewed grace in all of our lives, God, whether it's our times in the morning with you or at night or wherever we spend time with you. God, whether it is at, at church on Sunday mornings or a youth group, God, or small groups. Lord, I pray for the creative power of Yahweh, for Jesus of Nazareth to come forth in those moments with creative power. And that, God, you would save Young men and young women especially, but God, many from this generation in the way that only you can do. Lord, save us in the way that only you can do. We love you, Father, and we cherish you, Father, and we worship you, and we honor you. And we ask you to come now as we worship you and create in us clean hearts and clean minds in Jesus' name.
Stepping out on a limb here, maybe just to have uh, two or three people next to you gather together and pray for each other around these things.